And kia ora koutou to everybody out there. Uh, big shout out to Mike, my colleague, and uh, George and Matt for your keynotes. Wonderful to, um, for you to share your insights and thank you for that. And uh, yeah, welcome to everybody out there too. To me, Mark Jones, a little bit about me. I'm uh, i tipu aui, raro i te maunga o Nongataha. So I grew up underneath the, underneath the mountain of Nongataha in Rotorua. If I could claim a river, it would be the Kaituna, because I think that's the one that's taught me the most lessons. Um, it's difficult being a Pākehā, you know, because you move around. So um, I'm in Auckland now, and so uh, Paremaremo is my home. That's where I, that's the community I'm from. So anyway, um, looking to the future. Um, it's challenging looking into the future. I'm trying to crystal ball gaze, and when I think about the future of outdoor education, I'm reminded of a movie that Jack Nicholson and uh, Helen Hunt starred in. And Jack Nicholson plays this OCD writer. He writes women's stories. At one point, he, he muses, he asks the question of his life, what if this is as good as it gets? What if this is as good as it gets for outdoor education? Maybe uh, like every generation, I like to think that I, I lived through the, the golden era of my time, but I, I think I did, you know, with outdoor education. It was a time uh, before unit standards. Now, I'm nodding in the audience here. Um, it was a time before before the HS yet, you know, when we, we wrote policy and we centres audited each other's programmes because it was a good idea, you know, not because uh, we had to do it. Um, it was before we took climate change seriously. We took that can down the track and all its associated responsibilities. Didn't have to worry about that. There were no such things as some of these words we hear nowadays. There were no screen ages. And they had TV screens and they didn't carry those around in their pockets all day. There were no helicopter parents. <laughs> and we didn't have free range kids. We just called them kids. Um, it was an exciting time because outdoor education was coming to terms with its impending professionalism. And, um, and that was exciting to be part of. And, and you could judge school fees back then because Parents could afford a house and they still had two arms and two legs, you know. And there was no COVID. You know, lockdown was a prison term, not a community term. So, um, so maybe this is as good as it gets. And there, there are certainly some issues that are not going to go away. Um, climate change won't get any better in my, in my lifetime, you know. I'm sorry, George, I love your sentiments and I agree with you wholeheartedly that we've got to do everything we can, but, but it ain't going to get better for a long time, not, not in the lifetime of my kids probably. Inequality, well, that hasn't got much better in the 50 years that I've been alive. That, that'll stay with us. Screen time, you know, that's here for the foreseeable. We've got to embrace that if that's... Um, it's not going to go away unless we have some major collapse in our telecommunications, in which case things got a whole lot worse real fast. So call me a pessimist, but I prefer to be called a pragmatist. You know? But I just, I just see the storm building a bit and the storm getting worse, which is great. This is great for outdoor education because it makes us more relevant than ever. You know, there's never been a time, I don't think, where outdoor education has been as relevant as it is now. So that's a good thing. Um, that was that slide. <laughs> uh, in, in 2006, Robin Zink and Mike Boyce um, did a survey of outdoor education in New Zealand's primary and secondary schools and, and they reported a number of barriers. These, these were what they were. So 14 years later, Alan Hill et al. in their national study of, of um, EOTC, which was published this year, 
exactly the same list of issues. None of them have changed too much. In between times, Dave Irwin, um, you know, explored the legitimacy of charging parents for their children's outdoor education experiences, which kind of exacerbated many of those, many of those above there. There's a few issues too. There's another issue too that I suspect is going to become increasingly hard for outdoor education. Um, for our outdoor sector really to ignore as the 21st century rolls on. In, in Norway, they call this the sustainability paradox of Friluftsliv. It's their version of outdoor education. Uh, and the paradox is that what many of us perceive to be kind of nature-friendly activities like outdoor recreation and hence out, much of outdoor education actually is imperils the climate as much as anything else. Um, Guholt and Hawkland you know, found that of all of the leisure activities, this was in Norway, outdoor recreation was about the worst in terms of, if not the worst, in terms of its ecological footprint. So um, Irwin and, Irwin and Straker, Dave Irwin and Joe Straker, wrote in 2015 about um, sustainability education and that opportunity that outdoor education has. They wrote, the popularity and emotional engagement outdoor education can generate opens the doors for teachers to address the complex issues of thinking about the future and taking action to tackle the underlying sociological reasons for unsustainable practices. And, and you can see how that's, that's this wonderful opportunity that outdoor education has, right? That, you know, we should have a major part to play in educating our youth for sustainability. We should be, um, contribute at least meaningfully to that space. Um, but that's a challenge for outdoor education because it means that we're gonna have to walk our talk in that sustainability space. And I don't think many of us do now. We, we have a lot of travel and for some of our programs. We are equipment intensive. You know, we have a big technological and, and environmental footprint to what we do. You might notice a young um, Micah Hemera in that photo in the middle somewhere. A trip long ago, Micah. Um, yeah, so as we as we try and get our students to build their personal efficacy in this, in this sort of sustainability space, uh, we're gonna be increasingly challenged to walk our talk in that. So that's quite a few issues, you know, that are all pressures that are pressing down on, on our sector, our, our practice, whatever you want to call it. Uh, of all of those, the most important to me, the most pressing issue I think for our sector is equity issues. You know, when I was when I talked about those golden years um, of outdoor education, I was instructing the children of pretty well-heeled parents at Tihoi Adventure School, you know, or um, or instructing the school kids that could afford to send their kids to the then outdoor pursuit centre. You know, I don't think I spent too much time anguishing over the the vast majority of New Zealand school children that, that just couldn't afford that sort of outdoor education. <clears throat> um, but that to me, so that to me is the most pressing issue, this, this equity issues. Every child should be able to access quality outdoor learning experiences, but not every school has the resourcing, they don't have the, the human resourcing, they don't have the financial resourcing to make that work. Or do they? Or do they? Do they think that outdoor education is this choice between high tech, you know, high pursuit orientated outdoor education or expensive residential, you know, centre courses that you get from a residential centre where it's trips away and travel and overnight trips and 
which just doesn't work for a lot of communities, either financially or, or culturally. Um, so what I wish to talk about today, anyway, is, to me, um, in a large part, can address all of these issues, or most of them. Okay, what I want to talk about is it's, it's an inexpensive form of outdoor education. There's less compliance associated with it because it just doesn't have those high levels of risk. You don't need qualifications beyond what you teachers already have. It can be chunked, can be chunked so it fits into timetables easily. So it can be done locally, it can be done on campus. It's got a pretty small ecological footprint, you know, but it's rich, it's really rich in learning. So it's making, it's making stuff and call it crafting or craft making, but essentially it's um, engaging students in the process of, of making things. Essentially from natural materials and it's, you know, there's a, a list of different sorts of craft you could include there. So it includes lots of technologies, the technology of fire, you know, fire as a tool, primitive fire making, how to use fire to, I don't know, forge as well as to um, burn holes to make spoons or whatever you might do. Um. <clears throat> There's a superficial level you can do this stuff on. You can do some leather work. You can buy a hide and cut up some belts, do some leather work with students. Or you can... Um, I'm here at Mags, There's, they've got sheep out in the paddocks right next to them. They're sheep. You can harvest a sheep. You can skin it. There's a whole lesson in that. You can go through the, the chemistry of using wood ash to get rid of the wool. Except you'll keep the wool. You'll keep that for your lesson on animal fibres. And then you can look at how you make leather. You make leather using bark. These are old technologies, you know, but they've they're rich, rich in learning. Um, and there's huge amounts of cross-curricular stuff here, you know, especially with chemistry um, and culture and uh, social studies. <clears throat> so um, it, it can, be as, uh, can be as simple as weaving a flax flower or braiding some mukka or something or or embedding a little bit of power shell, personalising some paddle or personal bit of kit you have. Or it can be building the paddle. Or it can be building the waka. You know, there aren't limits to how this could play out in an outdoor education setting. You can build your own boats. A broad definition of crafting might simply be the making of things for mostly, for mostly uh, natural materials using basic technologies. And within that, you know, is a lifetime of learning. Just, you just keep opening worlds of knowledge. John Laurie established a multi-level crafting program at the Michael Parks School at Ellerslie, which has been um, over a decade ago, and it's still, it's still functioning, still running strongly. Um, and he describes, he describes making, as a, he says, making is a fundamental literacy which should combine with numeracy and written language, written language skills for holistic learning. So true. His outdoor classroom model embodies this whole of human, whole of life approach to develop practical wisdom. Practical wisdom. Mike talked about the uncertainty that's coming in the, that's here now and is coming more of in the future, potentially. Practical wisdom is something our kids need more than ever, I think, to deal with that uncertainty and practical skills with it. Uh, one of the educational, uh, sorry, um, is the outdoor classroom is built on some key understandings and principle amongst those was um, that humans learn best, hands, heart and head in that order yep and do reflect apply and do again um, it's 
Now, it's, drafting is, I think it's patent that it's, it's a great way of engaging students with one another when you see the collaboration and the sharing that goes on. But and when you look at the literature, there's some widespread support for a lot of other things that uh, can come out of a, a program of making that uh, strong outdoor education outcomes or just great outcomes for you know, developing human potential. On that list of pressures I put down, I could have put, uh, I could have put COVID, except that Trump said it would be gone by next week. But, but, but even COVID, right, crafting is a fantastic way to get through COVID. You know, if you have a crafting passion, then, man, that is, that is gold, being locked down for a time so you can focus on that craft. <coughs> um, there's a spin-off too, if you're into um, Matauranga Māori, I think there are natural links to Matauranga through all of us networking with the natural materials in New Zealand and you can make those links to it stronger by your kaupapa and your tikanga and how you deliver it. Anyway, I could speak all day about the virtues of crafting but it's not actually what I wanted to talk about. Um, I wanted to just talk about one small part of this in on how at AUT we're trying to strengthen this as part of our program and that was providing a venue for it to take place on campus. So we realised that if we want to offer crafting activities uh, then we need a place where the students can go and actually get messy and, and practice that stuff. Uh, you, you know, Picture a group of students, they've got sharp knives, they're whittling and making a mess with flax and stuff um, lighting fires, it just doesn't work out so well with security and cleaners around AUT. So we needed a dedicated space that could, um, that they could feel was their space to go and use. So this was pretty much the, the slide I used as the, as the initial proposal. Uh, it was to serve three key needs of the space, an alternative space to the lecture theatre. You know, we wanted something, you know, that wasn't, didn't have quite the rawness of nature, but not the sanitised sort of cleanliness of a, of a classroom. You weren't that in-between environment where you didn't have to wear a raincoat. And a place where we could burn stuff. So, um, and a place where the students felt like, um, you know, it was their space that they owned as much as we did. So we had this vast, untapped potential in this lower field that uh, hadn't had anything done to it in two decades other than helping keep one of the gardeners employed mm -hmm. So we, you know, we said we'll section off uh, the end of it and we'll, um, that's where we'll locate this classroom. I mentioned uh, John Lawry, well this was his classroom at Michael Park School. So he, he built this eight years ago and uh, it's still still functioning strongly as a classroom on the school. <clears throat> so um, using that as a kind of a template, we decided to, you know, get out the sort of you know, design and ruler and, and start constructing our own sort of idea of what else would look like. So we built a scale model, um, made sure it was going to work. One of the, um, the ethoses of our build was it had to be cheap, right? I mentioned equity. We wanted to show that this was something you could roll out in the lowest socioeconomic school in a place. This was something you could build in a school that couldn't afford outdoor education. So it had to be pretty much zero cost. So, um, so this is us. Uh, I had a neighbour who had some bamboo that was encroaching on the other neighbour, so he was, he was really happy for me to thin that back. So one weekend, a couple of students and I got busy and chainsawed up a storm. Um, another student with rowing connections um, arranged a trailer for the price of a box of beers and we got them across town sort of semi-legally <laughs> to AUT. Uh, and then we rattled around the rest of the campus. You know, there were caches of cobblestones and old posts and bricks and mulch, uh, waratah standards, all sorts of things. And so I sort of 
said, oh, yeah, I'd like that. I'd like that. Can we have that? Can we use that? And they said yes to it all because it was all sort of excess stuff from other projects that was waiting for a purpose. And, and we were that purpose. So um, this is kind of how it went. Um, I, think this, I think this plays as a video in a minute. Um, so we set aside a, a weekend in the mid-year holidays um, on a see who turns up kind of basis with the outdoor staff and the students. And so it went over two days. So the, the, the plastic sheeting there for the fence was actually the roof of a failed uh, walkway. It was a, it was a um, design disaster. And so they had this stuff stored under a building that for years. So that became our, our fence. You know, it probably wasn't our first choice of what we'd build a fence out of, but it was free. So we used it. It was all about recycle. Um, so uh, it was a good exercise in health and safety as well, as you can see. Anyway, as, um, as proud as we were of that space, um, it lasted about a week. <laughs> Sadly, there was just no margin for error in the design. And over the course of the week, with a bit of slackening and the guys and the, the lines and a little bit of dishing in the stretch in the fabric, and then several inches of heavy rain, um, I went to check on my baby at the end of the week, and it was just a collapse beyond repair. So we had to rethink the fence, the patio, everything else was everything else was fine, but we had to rebuild. So we went to try to improve an A-frame after that. We were like, okay, this has stood the test of time, and it's still standing a year later. So this is um, this is Matua, Robert Brown, uh, uh, Robert Hogg, sorry, um, doing a, a kaki opening. It was a you know, mihi maiora sort of a cross between Tai Chi and a karakia with his breathing and acknowledgement of the four winds and actions. The students provided the food on that day, so they turned up early, got the fires going, and cooked up a storm of cinnamon scrolls in these camp ovens uh, for the guests, and so they fed anyone. It was, a, it was a really special and unique occasion at the university. This is kind of how it looks now. We've got stumps from a fallen tree that are the chairs in there. Um, there's a whiteboard now, so we can take it down there. And we've planted it up, so we'll screen off the gaudy white fence a little bit and have a nature trail. And a, we've got a paha to kick you there. So this is but one version of what an outdoor classroom could look like. Um, this is Swanson School's outdoor classroom. It's essentially a container village. Three containers linked together with tarpaulins. Matt Shields is a genius behind this. He used to be a maths teacher, but then progressed into teaching more and more craft-based stuff. And so now they, um, they have racks of files, boxes of feathers. They've got a part of kick out the front. They've got a box of you know bamboo sticks for making things out of all that. All sorts of resource, which everybody else throws away, they've got, you know, old files you can make knives out of and the rest of it. Incongruously, they've got a big screen TV in this place. And this is one of the, I don't know, the unusual things about technology, new technology is fantastic for teaching old skills. So these old traditional technologies like flint napping or... Um, weaving or whatever it might be, you know, um, primitive fire lighting, that sort of thing. Put it on big screen TV now, you just got to find the, the, uh, the, um, the uh, YouTube video. So if you want to know how to make a fire out of a cotton boat bud, a pinch of ash, ash and uh, cold ash and two boards, you know, you can just go to the YouTube video and figure it out. You want to know how to build your own knife? Go to a tutorial. So the students don't need teacher expertise 
you know, they need your enthusiasm, they need your, you know, support of them and encouragement. They need some tools and they need a place to do it. And this is the sort of thing that can enable, can enable this stuff in, um, in every school. Criston <clears throat> um, School has one of the most enviable outdoor education programs probably in the country and, and a pretty enviable budget with which to run it. And one of the IUT students currently is, is designing and proposing, putting forth this whole proposal for an outdoor classroom for Criston School. So they've embraced the space. They can afford any form of outdoor education that they want, but they employ uh, Omine Ivert every week to run some pretty feral, kind of bushy, bushcrafty activities on the school that um, culminate in an urban sort of Mrs. Moore journey through Albany um, in an overnight in the rough at the back of the school. So um, I look forward to seeing what their uh, the outdoor classroom looks like probably an upgrade on ours I'm picking but um, it'll be function and feral craft is my word not Hannah's but it's it'll seem feral from the school's perspective because it's it's often dirty it's messy it involves fire and sharp knives um, but it's rich rich learning Um, but we don't have too many principles. I guess one thing I wanted to share was f from the, the things that were surprised with the community building that happened through this project. It linked us so tightly to all sorts of staff and people at AUT and to community members. One of the ethos, as I mentioned, was definitely uh, recycle, reuse, repurpose, don't spend any money. Uh, we did end up paying for that tarpaulin over it because we didn't know what we'd end up advertising to the motorway, but, but you could do that with advertising hoardings, you know, for next to nothing. Those pool tools were just repurposed from two broken ones. We just put them together and made ones that were functional. Um, what's next? I'm not sure. The students that promised me from the last intake that they were going to build a pizza oven, so I'm looking forward to that um, being built at some stage. My vision is to have a pit forge. So pit forging and making steel knives could be quite an expensive activity at school, but, or you can get students to tread up some clay and cow dung and make some hand pad it around some bricks and form a pit forge where you can make just the same knives, just as good. And not from the, well, I've got the 1075 carbon steel but um, from old files or old car springs. Um, I'll just finish with this last one last slide. Um, <clears throat> Bruce Archer, the professor of Royal College of Art, had this old great aunt who, um, who was attributed to having having come up with the three R's, but she always maintained that it was a misquotation of an earlier a aphorism, which was this one up here. Reading, reckoning, and rotting. A young person's experience with rotting was considered to be the foundation and development of thinking. So crafting is not just about making stuff, it's about making the person. It's not just about transferring materials, but it transforms. It transforms the maker. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.